MJ, uh, Mary Judith Jean Louise, otherwise known to me and uh, to friends as MJ. Uh, and she is an incredible entrepreneur and multidisciplinary artist. And, uh, but I'll let you kind of tell people what you do. So MJ, first of all, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice to, to talk to you. And um, so, yeah, I know you as a social media expert. You've helped my company tremendously and a lot of other companies I know do amazing work on social media, how to extract the story and your personality and be, you've helped me be more myself as much as possible uh, on social media, which I find really hard. But how do you answer the question? If somebody asks, what do you do? How do you tend to answer that? Uh, it really depends on who I'm talking to <laughs> yeah. and what, the, what setting I'm in because uh, I consider myself an artist, but mm -hmm. I do a lot of different things. I do graphic design, I do social media. I started my own like little business company with a friend where we actually get um, single people together. I have a background in interior design. So that's why I'm like a uh, multidisciplinary artist. What are you looking right. for? <laughs> yeah. And so where do you find that most of your... Where do you, okay, let's let's put it like this. Where do you find that most of your bread and butter comes from? Where do you find that you're most like passionate about in those areas and do those always intersect? And where is the best intersection of those? Um, it has changed over the years. So lately it's been mostly social media, uh, content creation, marketing, and also mm -hmm. graphic design. Right. Um, passion is into art and personal development. So I'm finding a way to kind of merge these things together slowly mm. but surely. Yeah, it's been evolving. <laughs> yeah, years. I mean, that's, uh, it's amazing. I love the idea of personal development through art because I, I mean, I know um, statistically there's a lot of stuff that shows kids who've been through like horrible stuff can, can do a lot of therapeutic, have a lot of therapeutic benefits by drawing or doing drama or music and stuff like that. My sister used to work uh, and help kids who'd, who'd been through stuff and, and, you know, do drama with them. And I know that there's a huge benefits there. And then of course, for adults, it can be a little more sophisticated and a little more sort of um, focused. So when you say art through personal development, um, is that the kind of thing you're talking about or is it helping people? Yeah. Could you just expand on that a little more? Well, so far, because I've been working on myself, it's been, and art has been helping a lot. So it's been using art to discover things and sharing that information with other people. So whether it's right. like, you two should create art, you two should meditate, like you should think about these type of things. Like it's kind of like bringing all these things together and whatever people, like however I can help people discover more about who they are as I'm going through the process as well. That's basically what's been happening. I hope that answers. No, yeah, that's that's great, and so it's really very much a um, uh, hum like a, a self guinea pig kind of thing, where you uh, yeah. are the guinea pig yourself first, and then you go, okay, I've tried this, or I know it works, or I know it doesn't work, yeah. which I think is really valuable, especially as entrepreneurs, is to say instead of like I've read this book, it told me to do this, or I worked with this mentor, they told me to do that. I've tried this myself, and here's how it, how it's worked for me. Yeah, yeah, and I also include the other stuff. I also read. I've been part of masterminds where we actually work like through ourselves. So there's my experience, there's my my friends and peers' experience, and there's books and podcasts. I basically take it all in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, which is valuable as well. Certainly, like you know, just to to. to um, let's say to summarize a book or to talk about how a book's affected you and, and recommend it to, to people is, is extremely valuable. I love getting a good book recommendation or, or even like, you know, Netflix show or anything like that. Yes, 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 um, yes. So, but how do you, um, yeah. So how do you see, how, how do you see as a social media expert, which mm -hmm. I think you are, and I think that's probably pretty provable. Uh, how do you, uh, how do you see putting out value to the world? Like what is the best way to share yourself? I remember one time you told me like, as long as you're sharing your story, then that has value and you don't have to be an expert in what you're talking about because it is your own life. Yeah. So how do you see that when you either counsel or um, advise other people on what to put on their social media or you put your own stuff out? What do you think is valuable to put out there? Anything that's going to help people relate and put positive energy out there. Because at mm. the end of the day, I see social media as social. <laughs> right. It's human interacting with other humans type thing. And I also think about what am I attracted to when I like, who am I following and why? And then I try to kind of like put that back into the people that I'm helping. Like I'm following these people because I'm getting value out of it and I'm becoming a better person out of it. And I 
try as much as possible with my client to do the same thing, like put things out there that are actually going to help people become better, a better version of themselves. And that's where they'll want to have you as part of their, you know, their routine, their life type thing. They want to look for what else you have to say because it helps them as well. And they feel like they're part of your, yeah, you're part of their community in a virtual way type thing. So it's almost like by sharing what you're going through or, or what you're struggling with, I, I guess, or, or something that has put you in a positive frame of mind. It's almost like affect, like affecting them as a, as a friend. Um, you know, the friends that you meet up with and you're just like excited to go see them. And like, after you hang out, you laugh and you talk about interesting shit and you're just like, have such a good time hanging out with them versus the people that for whatever reason you still see, you don't relate to as much. And it's a bit more of a chore to spend time with them, whether that's friends or family or, or whoever you kind of have a social obligation to see. Um, and, and so like what I think you're saying kind of is that if you can make somebody feel like, like they're, you're a good friend, then inherently they find value in your sort of social media content. I mean, either a good friend or a good mentor, because I mean, I find that it's good to have different, different friends at, um, from different fields or different categories. So yeah, think, right. Friends where you're actually going to just have fun and laugh and things like that. And some other yeah. friends we actually going to go deep and some of the friends you're just going to learn about finance and stuff like that. So yeah. whatever, like you don't have to share everything, like whatever you decide, that's the value that you want to offer, whether it's like business or, or mental health or just entertainment, like as long as you offer value, it's all good. Yeah. It's, it's so funny because we can clearly see what we like or what we find valuable when we scroll through social media. But when it comes to sharing our own stuff, it, it's almost becomes this confusing stew of stuff and you don't know how to extract value. You don't know how to recognize value in what you talk about. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, as both of us, part of the work that we do is help other people kind of tell their own story and, and deliver value. But then when it comes to, or certainly I'll speak for myself, when it comes to my own stuff, I'm like, oh, nobody was going to care about that. Or, oh, that's not good. <laughs> or, or I think, oh my God, people are going to love this post and then nobody cares. And so it's, it's, um, it's a really interesting thing. Why, why do you think it's so difficult for us to see the value in our, in ourselves in terms of what we share? And what do you think gets in the way of people really being either their fullest self on social media, their most like interesting, valuable, exciting version of themselves? What, what, why is that so tough? Oh, that's an interesting question. I feel like because it's such a non-natural way of communicating. Just yes. <laughs> right. And there's also so many um, uh, interference and ideas of like people that are on social media because they're they're faking it and stuff like that. So we have all these things in our mind and we're like, well, I don't want to look like this, but I, mm. I, do I look like that? So there's all like the, the the mind chatter that kind of gets in the way of why are we here in the first place type thing. And if we can realign, and it's easy because I do the same thing too. Like, should I post this? Or how does that look? Da, da, da. But then if we can realign to be like, you know what? It doesn't really matter as long as my intention make sense and I follow that intention however they react to it that's like I, I don't have any control over that I shouldn't right. focus too much on like how are they going to react because then you so you start becoming the person that pulls just to be able to get likes and then you yeah. kind of veer off from what you're here for in the first place and attracting the people that connect to that no matter what right and that's almost kind that that's that veers into the territory of, of something I talk about a lot, which is like the artist versus the business person. Mm -hmm. So the artist in general, like, you know, ideally an artist goes, this is what's going on in my heart, my mind. I'm going to share that with the world. If nobody buys it, that doesn't matter as long as I share it in the most honest, authentic way to myself as an artist. Like I'm, I'm saying what I want to say. I'm, I'm making my music or my art, my paintings or my writing. It's all the way that I want to do it. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of, let's say, highest expression of art. And then business is the exact opposite. It's like, it doesn't give a shit what I, what I like or what I want. What does the market want? What do people, what will people pay for? How do I like conform to, you know, the market research? Oh, customers want this, or this is valuable. And even though I think this, the world needs this, they're telling me not. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to adjust everything that I'm doing for the market. Mm -hmm. So what I, what it sounds like you're talking about is actually taking a bit more of an artist's approach to social media. Um, well both <laughs> more about right more about, yeah because i didn't like there's you can also go too far as uh, as an artist and be like i'll just post whatever i want and i don't really um i'm not like you're not there to offer value at the end of the day right. you have, like, if you're offering value you kind of 
mix both of them together. Mm. Like you're offering something that's still um, honest to who you are, but it still serve whoever your audience is. Right. And yeah. technically, hopefully businesses are supposed to do that as well. And then eventually, at least that's the way that my mind works, um, eventually you'll be able to make money because you're also offering value. It's an exchange. Yeah. If it's not valuable, uh, like it's, it's one of these weird things. Like if you're pandering too much and you're not, you, you're no longer true to who you are, then it, it becomes fake. And it's kind of like this weird thing that nobody wants to associate with. But if you remain who you are, you know what kind of, what kind of value that you want to offer and you offer that value by staying yourself but you also keep an eye on making sure that you're still offering value that's aligned with you i think it should work right so it's it's yeah it's it's a bit of both like mm -hmm. uh like most things yeah <laughs> yeah you can't go too far in one to the other i mean yeah and i think a lot of artists you know could use a, a healthy dose of the business um of the business principle of going like well yeah maybe i want to do a whole album of like goats sneezing into a microphone it's like, but nobody wants that shit so it's just like just think a little bit more about what people are going to be into but then of course a, a lot of business people fall into the trap of going yeah what will people like and mm -hmm. then of course a lot of people can have that gauge where they feel like someone's being needy or desperate or uh, yeah. thirsty for attention or whatever it is so they're just going like do you like this no okay I'll change everything and I'll make this new thing do you like that no okay I'll do whatever you like and you can kind of feel that and go I don't really, I don't really <laughs> like that person but those people who are able to kind of hone in on what they really love yeah. but present that in a way that people find valuable then they tend to really um, explode on the channels like Instagram or yeah, Facebook yeah, or or YouTube or LinkedIn. Yeah. It's, it's, there's, they've carved out enough of a niche that's true to them, but they've, they've still, they're packaging it in, in such a way that it's, it can be valuable to a lot of people. Exactly. At least that's the way that I'm, I mean, I'm still learning, but that's what it's yeah. so hard. I think from all the people that I, I really admire and I follow and I really look for what they have to say, it seems to align with who they are mm. and the value that they want to provide, whether it's sometimes it's really just to put some positive energy out there. Yeah. And it works. And then they find a way to, to turn that into a business. So, yeah. So I realized I haven't even uh, asked you this. We kind of uh, went backwards because I know your, your skill set so much and there's so much value that you can offer in terms of advice there. But how did you get into that? Because I forgot to ask you your story first. Like you see, you, you are an artist, mm -hmm. but you've found your way to kind of, you know, social media slash entrepreneurship slash uh, consulting and, and all this great business stuff. What is that? Uh, what was that kind of uh, arc of a story? It's such an interesting way. I started as an engineer, a building engineer, <laughs> a while ago, um, but it wasn't creative enough. I was repetitive. So I decided to uh, study interior design and then I became an interior designer and started my own business back in the days. And then I got overworked. Um, I guess it was like a mini burnout and I'm questioning everything in my life and when mm -hmm. I moved to Toronto I'm like let me just get more into the art side of of things because design I went there because it was more creative and I found myself becoming more of a manager and I wasn't creating anymore I was really just disciplining and checking people so when I came to Toronto I'm like okay let me start graphic design and it kind of just grew from there and from graphic design I started dabbling into art a little bit as well and that's how I kind of just everything got mixed up into <laughs> what I'm doing today. One big, yeah. <laughs> One big stew pot, yeah. Yeah, well, it's weird because I've always had the, the scientific mind and the creative mind. Mm. Um, but like I went too far into the scientific mind and then neglected the, the creative. That's where I became, that's why I became an interior designer. And I started to do that again. And then that's why I kind of like, I'm like, let me go back to be more creative. But also there's a business side that, I mean, like I, I'm still having to figure out like how to be a full-time artist and, and make a great living out of it. So it's like, yeah. all right, graphic design works and still do like paintings and things like that on the side. And then social media showed up. And I'm like, well, maybe I could do social media as well because I don't have to run around all the time. And then that's basically it. I wow. kind of fell my way through it so far. Yeah, well, it also seems like what people, if, if this is true, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you also kind of found what people were willing to pay you for. Uh, yeah, as a way to facilitate, you know, yeah, what how you wanted to live. Yeah, like we're like, I was looking into lifestyle, and I was also looking into what do I like to do and the value that I can bring. And I've always, for some reason throughout my life, I've always been part of like making things look better, like whether it's like 
being part of yearbooks, uh, designing uh, newsletters, uh, having my own blog posts and being creative, like uh, things like that. So it's always been part of what I do. So like, and when social media started, I'm like, oh, that's kind of interesting. And you kind of play a little around, a little bit around with it. You see what people are doing and you yeah. get information from people that are really good. And I'm like, I can do that as well. Let me try it out. Sounds interesting. Yeah. And just grew that way. Yeah. That's amazing. And I think, you know, you also probably have a pretty good sense about people uh, because I mean, you know, knowing you as well, but also like the work that you do. It, so it's interesting is you have the scientific mind, you have this artist's mind, you have this business person's mind, and you also have these, these people skills, which are, those are like four <laughs> incredible skills, <laughs> like success, which is amazing. And, and so, yeah, I want to, I, you know, a lot of my work covers the people side. So I'd love to talk to you a bit about that. Like, yeah, what is it? Where do you think your people skills come from in your life? Like, w how did you develop them? How did you develop the ability to kind of understand what people are looking for, what people want, what moves people, what motivates them? Where does that come from for you? Um, since I was a kid, I've always felt like I was like a an interim, like a, a I don't know how to call it, but like a counselor to my friends when I was yeah. a kid. I was the quiet kid that was very observant. I would talk mm. to everybody from any uh, groups yeah. right. um, about anything and the type of, of person that people would tell me their secrets and type things. So it was always, yeah, part of, I guess, my makeup. And I've mm. always been interested in like um, shows where like I, I, you you observe people's I always observe people's behavior and and mm -hmm. learn from it and being fascinated by it and even like reality shows I, I watch it from like a observer and the anthropological and kind of yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah right yeah. I do yeah. the same thing I do the same. <laughs> and uh, this whole idea of like knowing yourself understanding like I'm just going to mix a bunch of things like understanding people through like behavior, astrology, personality type, understanding myself through the way that I react to other people has always been part of what I do, who I am. Mm. And yeah, it just kept growing that way. So I think that's where it comes from. A lot kind, of kind of natural. Yeah, yeah, just interest, very just interest. Uh, and especially being a quiet kid, observing, seeing things before other people see it, noting things, and I just enjoy that type of mm. thing. So, yeah. That's really interesting. Um, it sounds almost like you're a, a really interesting mix of introvert and extrovert, you know? Yeah, I, I like to call myself a social introvert. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Um, that's, uh, it's the opposite of the Kendrick Lamar thing. He says anti-social extrovert, which I relate to a lot of the time. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's right. I, so I'm like the opposite one. Um, but yeah, like it, the observing, the power of observation, which I lose out on a lot, and I've only started to actively try to cultivate that in the last, let, let's say, five years of my life, because as you can probably tell, I'm a massive chatterbox. Like, I love to just talk and and riff with people, and I love to just hear my own voice and think out loud and, and think about, you know, get my thoughts out kind of by speaking them out loud and, and start to, to uh, organize my ideas in my head by speaking. But I, I think a lot of my life, I missed out on the observation part of social skills. So it was me kind of putting myself out there, but not sitting back and going, okay, what is this person doing? What is this person, you know, what are the relationships there? What do these people seem to like? Uh, I was just kind of like putting myself forward. Um, and I think that like, yeah, those of us who are inclined that way, extroverts, outgoing people, we miss out on a lot of observation. Mm. And so do you ever struggle in the opposite way where you had a hard time, let's say at parties or a hard time um, making new friends in a new place? Like, did you ever struggle in that sense of, of on the other side of the coin or were you kind of always good at, at in those? Yeah, I like, I'm not the type of person who's going to jump into a group and start talking. I'm more the type who's going to kind of like look, observe. And then if there's an opening, where I can have a, more of an intimate conversation with somebody, then I'll do that. So that's why, for example, like those networking event, I was never a fan of these things. So it's all like, hi, here's my card. Hi, here's my card. Yeah. And I'm like, like, no, nah. <laughs> yeah. this is not for me. But I would be the type of person who find some person to talk to. And I wouldn't mind talking to that person for the entire night and find yeah. out more about them as opposed to kind of like going, jumping from one place to the other thing. So yeah, so yeah, struggle. It's always like, cause I was a shy girl. 
not I'm not as much as I was before, but mm. so I wouldn't just go and be like, ha, ah, here I am type thing. But if I'm comfortable, I know the group, the group and we're talking about something that I'm passionate about, then I can go with no problem. Right. And yeah, I mean, those just remembering all these pre COVID networking things, like there's always this pressure to be like, yeah, get as many business cards as you can, or, you know, don't spend too much time talking to somebody because it's a waste of your limited time there, you know, just like hit them with a quick, Hey, what are you looking for? This was what I'm looking for anything there. Okay, great. Exchange business cards. Boom. But yeah, there's something so gross and transactional about that. And you usually also, I find is I also, I almost always do better business with people that I actually take a little bit of time to cultivate and have a real conversation with. Um, very rarely do I have a really great business outcome with somebody who I've just kind of been like, Hey, you looking for this? I'm looking for this too. Okay. Boom. You know, in general, I think, and when I lived in China and did business in China too, like that's a huge part of the Chinese business culture is like, we don't even talk about business until we've eaten dinner. Oh, like wait. we meet at a restaurant, we have dinner, we get to know each other, and then we can talk about business. Like you, that. It's a very much a, 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 business, a culture of doing business with friends or people at least that you have some relationship with, which is really nice. And it's kind of like, I mean, it can present its own difficulties, <laughs> like, you know, mixing business with friends, but there is something really nice about that. Yeah. Um, I think that's the way business should be. Like, I'm a bit of a contrarian when it comes to, to business and stuff like that. Because mm. I've done the, when I was an interior designer, like, I started my business twice, once in Montreal and restarted in Ottawa. So I had to go and meet people. And I went to this networking event. And, like, it was so transactional. I came back and, like, I'm never doing that again. Like, this yeah. is just not, just, my personality just not fit with that. I'm more the type to take things slow, get to know people, they get to know me, I get to know their value too, because I realize that if I, my value don't align with the people I work with, like I'm not interested in working with them. I don't care yeah. for them. Really. Like, yeah. it, like, again, I'm contrarian when it comes to these type of things, but it's like, if something is just shifty in the way that they, what they believe in, like yeah. it just doesn't align, I'm like, yeah, I gotta go. <laughs> yeah, you gotta get out of there. Yeah, I mean that's and that's an important instinct too. Sometimes I've ignored that instinct and been like, "Fuck, I should have listened to myself." Because yeah, we were, we were like, <laughs> a, an alarm was going off when we started talking, and I was like, "Well, I need the business or whatever." And then you know you keep pushing that conversation relationship forward, and then at the end you're like, "Oh God, what did yeah. I, why did I get myself involved yeah. with?" This? And it takes so much of your energy, and you're kind of like you're you're not doing what you love anymore. You're not being yourself, and then the the actual business, whatever the result from it, is not even that good. So you yeah. could have like lose that money and kept your energy. You probably find something a lot better. It's a yeah. It's a it's a less it's a less easily measurable resource, which is why I think it's harder for us to calculate. Like if you you can see the money in and money out on your books. You can go, okay, we need this many clients per month. We need this. And it's all very easy to calculate. Are we getting enough? And are we spending too much? And, you know, that's an easy, a very, a lot easier of a calculation. Yeah. Than but yeah. is what I'm going to be doing going to like nourish and feed and, and energize my, you know, soul for lack of a better word. Exactly. It's a lot harder to calculate. And there's no app, uh, at least sure. yet. <laughs> that exists. <laughs> that maybe that's something we can, we can figure out but see that's the thing that's the human side that i feel a lot of people are missing just check in with yourself how do i feel why do i feel that way mm. how can i make it better because that's what happened when i was in interior design like i was doing i was working i was pushing i was doing everything that i could and i was in ottawa which like it's not a very fast town it's a very slow town mm. And there was a point, and I did a lot of stuff. I was on TV, I was on the newspaper, whatever type thing. And then there was a point where I was coming out of doing like this, um, uh, like a show, like the Ottawa Home and Garden Show. I had a feature booth there. I worked, didn't sleep, whatever. And then I came into the parking lot and I, for the first time in my life, I had a, an anxiety attack, like a panic attack. And I yeah. breathe, and I'm like, okay, wait, <laughs> something's wrong. <laughs> Let me take a step back and realign and figure out like, why am I doing this? Like, is mm. this what I need to do? Like, am I going in the right direction or am I just following the, the the template that everybody follows just because that's what it is, but it has nothing to do with what I need to do in my life type thing. So I think check in. Yeah. Once you check in and then you actually take a step back and you really look into like, what, what do I want my life to be? Because we're not here to just make money and pay bills. Like that's not what we're here to do. And it seems a lot of time that's what we do. And it's like, okay, but let me take a step back. There's so many different ways to make money. What do I really want? What makes me happy? What kind of lifestyle do I want? And then work towards that. Yeah, building it. Yeah, building it. Like, what do you want to do all day and all week? 
Yeah. And then how can you make money off of that? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a lot more important than going, how do I make money? And then how do I not want to slam my head into a wall every day? You know, what do I have? <laughs> like, that's the, that's the opposite side of it. And, yeah. and that's, I mean, the beautiful thing that I think entrepreneurship offers is that you can really control yes. what it is yeah. that you are selling, talking about what industry you're in, what kind of people you're dealing with, what market you want to serve and types of customers you want to help. So it's, yeah. there's a lot more freedom there. Um, but we forget it sometimes. Yeah. We forget that we have the freedom. We kind of like, cause I did that as an interior designer, you kind of go and then you realize that you're just an employee with different types yeah. of, <laughs> with a bunch of different boss. employers. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, why did I get, why did I get out of a really good job as an engineer? Like you do good. You're set. Yeah. To be able to go back and do the same thing, but for myself and more stress, I'm like, nah. <laughs> yeah, in more different places with more yeah. different, like shorter term contracts. Yeah, it doesn't sound Not that. Worth it. Yeah, yeah. And so, but obviously, you did really well in order to like be on, you know, TV and be doing this stuff. So, like, yeah. So, I guess my question is, when you're doing well, for you, the the indicator that it wasn't right was an anxiety attack, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for that me, was the first one, yeah. yeah, so it was your first one. So, uh, yeah. do you uh, do you struggle with anxiety in general, or was this a very situation specific thing? It was a very situational. I was a workaholic when I was working as an interior designer, and like just the summer, especially construction is in the summer. So, the summer would pass, and then I wouldn't see the summer at all, and then it's like fall, and I'm like, oh wow, like the summer is fast. I've just been working non stop, it's all good. Mm. And I remember it. So there was the anxiety attack, which like kind of freaked me out type thing. And because I never had that before. I'm like, okay, something's wrong. This is not normal. I'm not supposed to, to be that way. And I remember a time when like two years into the business in Ottawa, I, it was my birthday. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take a day off and I'm just going to have fun. And then I really sat down and I'm like, what? How do I have fun? Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. like, that's not normal. Yeah. <laughs> like, that. just, you know, I'm like, all right, something's wrong. I need to kind of like yeah. fill it and figure it out. So yeah, that's how. Interesting. Yeah. Cause for me, like when I, when I launched uh, my current company out loud three years ago, I, the second after we launched, like the second after we had like put our website out there, uh, you know, declared ourselves open for business and did a big social media blast to be like, Hey, here we are. Uh, I woke up every morning for like three and a half weeks uh, with a panic attack. I would wake up and I was like, <laughs> and I, was, I was like uh, checking my phone frantically for an email. Like, did I, has somebody emailed overnight and I need to answer them right away. And I just kind of, I mean, this is another thing I think you do a lot better than me, but your self-awareness to have one and go, this is not right. <laughs> it was great. I, it took me about three and a half weeks. And the only reason that I even decided to deal with it was because I met a friend who was in town and we went for like a walk and he's had a lot of men mental health issues. And he was like, I told him about this. And I was kind of like, isn't that hilarious? And he's like, no, that's not funny. You need to deal with that <laughs> right now. And so I was like, oh, okay. And I went to the doctor and they're like, yeah, that's this, you need, you have anxiety or you, you know, you have to, um, and I'd already been kind of diagnosed with depression before that. So depression for me has been my, let's say default setting. So I never really had this like elevated heart rate. I never really had this like fear that I needed to be doing something. I had the opposite, you know, kind of symptoms of depression, which is I don't want to do anything. Nothing matters, blah, blah, blah. And then anxiety was starting to creep in there of like, oh my God, I have to do so much stuff. I can't sit still. I can't relax and have fun. I can't take a day off. Um, but for me, it was less an indicator of that I was doing the wrong thing and more an indicator that I was thinking of the thing that I loved in the wrong way. Oh. And I think this relates to the point you were making about like having a lots of different employers. So I was making myself at the beck and call of potential clients. If I didn't answer them right away, I was failing and I was going to get in trouble uh, or, you know, I was going to like lose the business or I was going to lose my reputation. Uh, and I needed to serve, you know, I needed to answer everyone as soon as possible in the most like, you know, so I just had no sense of like, no, I have a certain capacity for attention and energy and time and I have to recognize those limits. So for me, the flipping of that was going, okay, what am I capable of? And how can I kind of forgive myself for reaching the top of my capacity? And I still struggle with that like crazy. Do you struggle with that? A thing about like, 
let's say at the end of a work day, end of a work week or whatever, you have a couple more things on your to-do list, but you're like, I just can't do it. If you reach that, do you kind of beat yourself up or are you good at kind of being like, that's it. I'm, this is my capacity. And over the past couple months, years, I've learned to let that go. It's not perfect. Yeah. <laughs> it's always it's so like, hard ah. for me. Yeah. But it's one of these things where I, I shift my perspective. Um, the whole, like, I'm not saving lives here. Yeah. Like, so I take a step back and I also, like, I realize this, this, um, this loop that I was getting myself is like, I always have to do more. There's always more to do. And I realized, but there's never an end to it. So this is kind of like a weird feedback loop. It's like, I'm like, do I like to be in this loop? Like, what's the, what's the thing about like, uh, you do more, do more, do more, do more. And it's, you're never enough. It's never enough. Yeah. It's like a weird thing. I'm like, okay, <laughs> step back, realign myself. What's the purpose of my life? That's not it. Why am I putting these up in this situation? So I find like a lot of journaling a lot of self-reflection and you meditate? Uh, in different ways. Uh, I find journaling for me is the, the, cause I have so much things in my head. Yeah. I do morning pages. I, I restarted to do morning pages a lot just to kind of like reflect. And now I also take just like 15 minutes to just stop, do nothing, mm. take a breath. I mean, yeah, that's basically meditation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cause I realize that it's easy to get into that that loop like you get into the work mode and you just go 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 time pass you don't know what's going on type thing and then you're tired you stop and you start over again it's like no nah, that's not a human being i'm like i'm not a machine yeah i need to stop i need to reflect so aligning myself like being having a dog is a huge huge help yeah i think to go out take some fresh air relax realigning and realizing a lot of the time like these pressure that i put on myself is really artificial like, yeah. It's like, I have to do this now. Like, do I really have to do this now? Yeah. Let me just look at my schedule. No, you can actually do it tomorrow. It's going to be fine. <laughs> like, yeah. like, oh, and, yeah. and, and even like, and sometimes even the things that other people, like for me, it's, it's, it's the worst when somebody else is like waiting for it. For, I think it's, I have a people pleasing uh, instinct in me. That's like, I, if I don't get it to them when they ask for it, I'm like, shit, they're going to, you know, be mad at me or whatever the hell it is. Like, you know, and then I'm always like, here's the thing. Sorry for the delay. They're like, yeah, don't worry about it. You know, and, yeah. and you realize that like most of the, yeah, most of the pressure, which causes all this anxiety, which of course means that the quality of the work that you do and the sustainability of how long you can do it for yeah. is suffers if you have anxiety. So it's so much more important to, yeah, take 15 minutes, take your dog for a walk, yeah. meditate, exercise, do whatever it is that you need to do for longevity, for sustainability, and for, you know, just calm and a sense of well-being. Because I think almost everybody out there would rather get a proposal two days late and then have you show up as your best self for the work itself mm -hmm. than like, you know. So it's, it is, there is so much artificial pressure and, and, you know, I think it relates to this idea that you're saying about like, what is your life for? And I think a lot of people, especially entrepreneurs, see that they have this sense that they want to make an impact on the world with their business. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge amount of pressure because it's like, well, you know, what does that look like? How do you know when you've done it and made it? How do you know when it's enough? How do you know when, you know, what is the revenue amount or what is the head company headcount that means that you've you've successfully made an impact on the world. And uh, if you listen to the people who have some of the biggest companies, they'll, they'll still tell you they suffer from huge amounts of, of mental health issues. I posted an article, uh, we posted an article on LinkedIn uh, a while ago uh, that was, yeah, about, about the psychological price of entrepreneurship. And so you really realize when you listen to these people who've, who've made it to like what we would consider the heights, that it doesn't ever stop. There's never enough until you take your mind out of it but it is wrapped up, I think, in how we feel about our self-worth without external yeah. validation. Yeah, yeah. That's why introspection is super important to kind of detach from that. Because a lot of the time it's like, why do you want to make an impact? Is it to make yourself look better or is it really to help? Mm. And how can you help if you're not helping yourself? Or so are, you re are you really helping if you come with an energy that's like anxious and I have to do this fast and that as opposed to actually taking the time? To really look like, is, is my impact really helping or is it just something that I can check 
put on a check button and say like, look, all the beautiful things that I've done for all these people, but you, you haven't really helped. <laughs> you just checked the box. Type yeah. thing. So exactly. Like if you have a million users, but it's a kind of clickbaity app thing that, you know, people downloaded and forgot about, is yeah. that a good impact? Or if you have a thousand people who are like, you know, just to give you a, a, a little like story from my art uh, mm -hmm. sort of side, I put out a, a, an EP of music. The first time I ever put anything out into the world uh, at the beginning of COVID. Cause I was just like, well, you know, now's the time. So I got all the map mixing and mastering finished. I kind of like, you know, got the album art done and I was like, okay, here it is. I put it out. And you know, nobody cared. Like, you know, a few people were like, Oh, this is really cool. And, but, but what was so nice was I was, I was sharing it because I was like, I just want to put this out there. I have no expectations or, um, uh, ego wrapped up in how it does or how it's received. I just want to share it. And then if people like it, great. If not, you know, who cares? I can't mm -hmm. control that, yeah. but it's for me mostly. But then curiously, like, yeah, a, a few people told me they liked it. And you know, it, it has very minimal views and everywhere that it is. But one woman sent me a, a message that her child had passed away and that my music was helping her through it. You know, and like a message like that is unbelievable to get. You never, ever would imagine that something that you did and that you kind of like stressed over and you felt it was fake and it was just, you know, you spend all this time with your artistic projects and you're like, am I, what am I doing this for? Who, who's going to care? Does it, is it garbage? Is it shit? Like, uh, uh, I don't know. I love it. I hate it. I love it. I hate it. You know, like all those transitions. And then you put it out there. And that's like the only real message I got that was like really personal. Every, like a couple other messages were just like, oh, cool music. But this one was just like, first of all, it's devastating to read that from somebody. But the fact that it had had that kind of positive impact at, on somebody's life and such a horrific time of grief, I was like, you can't really do, you can't really ask for an impact better than that, even though you hate that it came at such an awful moment. But, you know, we all remember the times in our life where music or art helped us yes, yes. And, and was really important. Yeah. And so to be that for somebody else, one and literally one person, the only message I've got, thankfully, uh, you know, that, 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 you know, but it, it, it was, it was worth it. Like I, and now I'm like, nobody needs to ever listen to this again. Yeah. Because like, that was such a beautiful, sad, but amazing message to get yeah very mixed feelings obviously but that's, but a, that's a real impact right do you do you think that business can have that kind of impact for people of course or definitely. yeah definitely it's one of these again my my weird views compared to society is like business is really just interaction between people at the end of the day like business is kind of like the cover but it's like really an exchange of, of value between people and it has an impact one way or another. The only thing is like, we can't fully know the empty, like how big of an impact we make probably way later on type thing. But if we keep ourselves from actually doing good, then we're actually keeping our, our, our self from, um, from helping people in, in the way that they need, like the, the song example, like that's the one person that told you about it. But there's probably another 10 people that felt the same way that might not tell you until like, you know, 20 years from now or something right. like that. Like yeah. we don't know. And a lot of the time we're kind of like so focused on controlling the result as opposed to just produce, let go, produce more, let go. And whatever needs to come to you will come to you. Um, it kind of reminds me of this, um, this analogy from our, our group that we, we talked about because I always look at nature to be able to remember, because we're part of nature, to remember like how to behave. And I remember walking my dog, and those are the things that come to my mind when I walk. I was walking my dog and I was looking at this tree, like in my neighborhood, there's a lot of trees and a lot of like um, trees with nuts and all these type of things. And I was looking at this one tree, there were so many um, acorns, tons of acorns all over the place. And I was just thinking, I'm like, isn't that amazing how nature produces with no care in the world of how much it produced, who's going to benefit from it, it just keeps going. It's just like, that's, I'm here to create. So acorns, some, some go on the street, some are crushed, some are eaten by, by squirrels, whatever. I just produce and I produce in massive quantity because that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And I was thinking I should do the same thing. Mm. Like I should just, whatever I'm meant to be creating, just put it out there 
and don't try to control where it's going because you're wasting your time trying to fit them in different boxes as opposed to just produce more. Whoever's supposed yeah. to receive it, how are they supposed to receive? That's fine, I think. Yeah. So business should be kind of the same way. They have the intention. You produce food. Produce the best food you can. Produce as much as you can with the price or whatever. And kind of just don't restrict yourself to all these. I, I'm going to go into philosophy, but this one. No, no, yeah, please. <laughs> Some of these companies are farming. I remember hearing that when I was younger, like farmers have all these milk that they produce, but they have to dump a portion of it because of the economy and stuff like that. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, that does not make sense. There's got to be, and like, you can't dump a lot of milk or whatever it is and have a bunch of people starving at the same time in your own country, let yeah. like not even going outside. Yeah. Like it doesn't make sense to me. And that's, anyways, that's my mentality and the way that i produce and i try to remind, to remind myself it's like just do the work stop restricting yourself yeah for artificial reason yeah like, because it's because it's all it's all ego anyways yeah. like yeah. stopping yourself from producing is a hundred percent to do usually with what you think people are going to think about it yeah it's like and i don't want to put this music out there because i'm worried people are going to laugh at it or judge it or think it sucks or I don't want to produce this product because it's not cool and slick yet. And I haven't gotten a great graphic designer like MJ to <laughs> make it all like slick and professional. So I'm not going to put out this like minimum viable product of my product of my service because I can't bear to have anybody associate me with this kind of like um, sloppy landing page, yeah. even though that landing page could be all the market validation you need to do. You just go, Hey, who wants to sign up for something like this? Like, you know, for your business about uh, connecting single people, yeah. you know, I don't know how your initial uh, testing went, but yeah. I imagine it was something like that. You had some kind of rough form of getting a sense of whether or not people would want something like this. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. And can you, yeah. What was that? Uh, just out of curiosity, what did that look it's, like? It's from a, it, it kind of grew on it. So, so I, got I, i've been divorced for two years now and i was talking to a friend about how like you know i've been in a relationship for 18 years like going into like the apps things is just not my thing mm. and we we're talking about that and she had gotten out of a relationship as well and we're like why don't we create an event where people just single people just meet because we're more into like people that are into like getting to know each other conversation and stuff like that so it was like a random thing and we just organized this little like slow dating event when we had like cards and people can actually meet each other and actually get to know each other on a more personal level as opposed to what do you do like what's your five-year plan type thing like yeah. superficial stuff then covid hit <laughs> like well we can't bring people anywhere but there's tons of single people um in toronto that have nothing to do how about we just have like a weekend conversation and they just get to connect and that's how things are slowly growing and we had like a meetup group we have an event, an event right so it's not like fully form yeah but the more we do it the better it is and the more information we're getting into like what people are really looking for, what's missing. Right. And, and that's how the business is kind of growing. So, and yeah. so <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's amazing. And I think obviously, I mean, I think there's a need for it, uh, you know, without, um, without doing the work, like it sounds like a good idea, but what you're doing, which is great. And, and what, you know, all entrepreneurs need to do is you're, you are testing it and you're seeing like, but yeah. you, but you weren't like, let me make sure I have like a super high quality studio and I have like handouts and I have all this stuff to do before I ever invite anyone to it. Let's just see, is this a need people have and are, are they going to show up? And then like, might there be a way to monetize that? And then, so you're just kind of putting it out there. Um, which is which is so fantastic yeah, because the thing is at the same time like while you're organizing and trying to plan everything people out there needs what you currently have to offer right. and the thing is too and that's something that i learned when i was an interior designer you can plan as much as you want like i used to have these plans and the drawings and like exactly which furniture where it's going to be like everything and then you get to the the construction site and there's changes like you'll have to, like, no matter how prepared and detailed and I have like exactly where the paintings are going to be and all these type of things, things happen and you have to redo your plans anyway. So it's the same for, I think business is kind of the same thing. Just have a general rough idea of what you want, what the intention is, and just go for it. Because as soon as you start, things are going to change. You, yeah. There's a lot of things that you're not going to know until you actually do it. And the thing, the funny thing about the um, our conversation is we had this um, this lady who came 
the second or third time she comes and she's like, oh man, these conversations are so great. Like I, you made me think about things I never thought about before. Like you should really come in and talk to the university student. I wish you knew that before. And I was like, I never thought about that before. Great idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if we were still in planning phase as opposed to just doing it and see how people react, that idea would not have come. And now we're yeah. thinking, yeah, that could yeah. be really cool so yeah. it's an amazing yeah as you said in terms of production like there is really nothing like talking to tons of people in for inspiration mm -hmm. incredible i mean i yeah for me i have a dog too as you know and and i take her to the dog park and i just talk to people from different walks of life different careers different ages different you know all these different things and you just chat with them you got the dogs to talk about so that's like the kind of in you're like oh how old is she what's her name blah 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 and then eventually you have a conversation and then you hear something you're like man that's so I never would have thought about this I don't know anybody who does what you do and that's so interesting and yeah I can't tell you how good that is for my uh for my brain and I think that at its best to kind of try to come full circle here. Social media can be that. Mm. It can be a just, um, I keep saying this word, but a stew pot of like ideas <laughs> that, 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 you know, everybody comes and brings their own ingredients and then it creates something new and, and you can learn so much and, and, you know, at its best, it, the internet and social media does do that. Okay. Um, I'd, I'd love, I think we have to stop here for today just for both <laughs> of our time, but I want to have part two of this conversation as soon as possible. So yeah, yeah hopefully you can come back. Absolutely. Amazing. <laughs> Thanks so much, MJ. This was, this was fantastic. Awesome. Bye. Bye.